Hi everybody, thank you for joining us for another Wild Sun Catchers for the month of May. This month we're going to be learning about and celebrating the shad bush, also known as Juneberry, also known as Serviceberry, also known as Shadblow or Saskatoon in Canada. Its scientific name, um, the, the genus, is Amelanchter. And we have about seven species across the state of Maine, most of which can be found along the coast. You'll find all of them in the Plants of Acadia National Park Field Guide, which is a wonderful book. Um, this plant is really interesting because we have seven species, but it does this thing in the wild naturally where it can hybridize um, amongst its various species. And so if you go to key it out, um, and identify the particular species, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky because of that natural hybridization that occurs. And other plants around us, like the willow and the wild violets, um, will do the same thing. Um, and you can kind of tell different species by looking at their, um, their leaves. Some of them are kind of this reddish brown, kind of bronze color. Some of them are much more bright green. This is not a shad bush, but um, kind of like a bright green, like here or here. Sometimes the leaves are downy or have hair on them. Some of the, sometimes they don't. Um, so there are various ways that you can kind of clue into that there are different species of shadbush in the area. Shadbush is native to Maine and it grows um, across most of the northern hemisphere. It's in the rose family, um, and it's also um, it's it's cool because it's related to. Um, apples and pears and cherries and strawberries. We even have some little strawberry blossoms down here. Um, and a characteristic of the rose family is that they have five petals um, for each blossom and oftentimes they're white or pinkish. Um, the apple is not native. Um, it's from the mountains of Kazakhstan. Um, but it's kind of naturalized in our area and you'll often find it in the woods where there were old homesteads um, or near rock walls. Um, so they're related, but shadbush is native, apples are not. This little strawberry is native. Um, so as I mentioned, this plant has many common names and I like to call it shadbush. It's just the name I'm most familiar with. And it has a, a really nice story behind that name. When the shad bush is blooming and these white blossoms are opening up the shad, which is a type of fish in the herring family, it's um, Andronomus, which means that it lives out in the open sea. And then around this time of year, it will swim upstream or upriver along the coast of New England to spawn. And at the same time that the fish are swimming back up into the rivers, um, this plant is blooming. And so people noticed that connection and decided to call it the shad bush. And I'm not sure for how long people have been calling it shad bush it, or in what languages. It could be for a very, very long time. It could be worth some more research. Another name um, I mentioned is serviceberry. And this is kind of connected to a little bit of um, white colonial settler folklore. Um, colonists noticed that when the shad bush blooms or the serviceberry blooms in the spring, the ground had thawed enough that they could have their funeral services and bury their dead. Um, and then also that the roads were passable for preachers or ministers to come in and um, do the services for weddings or um, other types of ceremonies. And so for the last couple hundred years anyway, people have been calling it um, serviceberry as well. So we've talked a little bit about um, the shad bush and what it looks like. But some other identification points are that the leaves are fairly elongated and have very tiny, fine teeth. Um, they often grow in wet, moist areas, but they're also very adaptable to many places. If you want to see some really big shad bushes, uh, they're, they're called bushes, but they can be shrubs or even trees. And if you want to see some really big ones, like where the trunks are like this big around, um, check out the golf course on Parker Point Road in Blue Hill. They're like these big trees that at any other time of year you might expect were like an oak or a maple, um, but you can see them in full bloom at this time of year and they're really spectacular. Um, in terms of harvesting the shad bush or collecting it um, for the project, um, for, for the May, May Crown project, 
You can probably um, find some alongside the roads. They love to grow in the ditches. Uh, you might have some in your backyard. If you need help locating some, um, contact me or Claire. And um, it is good to point out that the shad bush is about to kind of go by. <laughs> um, the petals are just starting to fall off. Here I'm going to show you. I'll just pick one. I don't want to pick too many, but um, the petals have fallen off of this one and you can see the little green um, ovary or berry is starting to swell. Um, and so if you can't find a uh, shad bush for your May crowns, there are many other uh, blooms that are starting to come out. Um, so by about mid-June around the summer solstice, the berries um, will be fully ripe. And this is another name comes from um, this time, the, the June berry. And the berries have been harvested and eaten by humans in this area for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and then more recently, in the last couple hundred years, they have been used for pies and jellies and wines. And um, some people say they taste a little bit like blueberries. Um, some people say they taste better than blueberries. I'm not sure about that. I have never tasted them myself. And that they have the nutritional value of a blueberry. So I think they're really high in like um, magnesium and calcium and iron and very healthy for you. Um, but the animals and the birds know this too. And most of the time they will have gobbled them all up before you even see that they're there. I'm going to show you. So they're about like 35 to 40 bird species that will eat the berries and cedar waxwings are a really common bird that you'll see in a flock on the shad bush in June. Um, but you might also see robins and thrushes and blue jays and scarlet tanagers and um, the titmouse. So, so many birds. Woodpeckers love to eat the berries. And I'm going to show you a picture of the berries since we don't have any right now. Kind of look like that. So kind of the color of blueberries, but a little bit different, longer stems. I guess they also have um, kind of a chewy seed inside of them that people say tastes like uh, almonds. The shadbush is also a host plant to the white admiral butterfly. And so this butterfly will lay its eggs on the leaves. And the white admiral butterfly has other host plants as well, but the shadbush is one of them. And shadbush is a very important food source for the queen bumblebee. Queen bumblebees are the only bees from their colony that survive through the winter. They hibernate in little holes in the ground or in your leaf piles in your yard or old garden stalks or garden debris. And they emerge in fairly early spring, very, very hungry. Um, and they look for nectar and pollen in flowers. And this time of year, or a little bit earlier, there aren't so many flowers. So they go for the spring ephemerals. And then they also love um, flowering shrubs like the shad bush and will collect the nectar and pollen. And um, this is another reason, this is kind of a little off topic, but um, to leave your leaves in your yard or to leave your leaf piles, if you've raked your yard, just leave them out or not to cut your garden stalks down until later spring um, because the queen bumblebees um, do like to hibernate in them. It's a good spot for other pollinators as well. So I think just the last thing, um, uh, deer and rabbit like to browse on the shad bush if they can reach them. Um, and in addition to the white admiral butterfly, the brown tail moth, if you're familiar with that somewhat invasive species that's moving up the coast, um, also likes to use the shad bush as a host, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the shad bush is in the rose family, apples are in the rose family, brown tail moths love apple trees as well. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're out in the spring and um, that the brown tail moth could also be on the, the shad bush. So thank you all for listening and learning about the shad bush and I hope you have so much fun making your blossom make rounds. Hi everyone. Welcome back to another month of Wild Sun Catchers. I'm Claire, the Youth Services Librarian at the Blue Hill Library, and today we are celebrating and talking about shad bush and apple blossoms. So I'm actually going to focus primarily on shad bush because I want to share a story with you. 
but um, I'm actually coming from my own yard um, where some shadbush are blooming today. So the book that I want to share is called When the Shadbush Blooms. And this book is by Carla Messenger, and um, she is a cultural educator and the director of Native American Heritage Programs, and she is of the Turtle Clan Lenape and lives in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And it's also written with Susan Katz, who has written eight children's books and lives in Pennsylvania. And the illustrations are phenomenal. And they are done by David Kanaikateran Fadden, and he is of Wolf Clan Mohawk, and he lives in Aguasazani, Ontario, Canada. So um, we're not going to read the whole thing today, but I did just want to share a little bit um, from this story so you get a sense of what this is about. So. I actually, I just wanted to read the synopsis so you get a sense. So, <laughs> it's a little bit windy today, so bear with me. When the shad bush blooms. Today, when a Lenape Indian girl ventures to the stream to fish for shad, she knows that another girl did the same generations before. Through the cycle of the seasons, what is important has remained, being with family, knowing when berries are ripe for picking, listening to stories in a warm home. Told by traditional sister and contemporary sister, each from her own time, this is a book about tradition and about change. Then and now are not so very different when the shad bush blooms. And so I'm just going to share from the first couple of pages um, so you get a sense, as they said, um, we see the past is actually on one side of the page um, of the book and kind of the present contemporary is on the other side and um, it's through the seasons but instead of them being by um, kind of the European method of months the way that we're more familiar um, the time of year is actually listed by a different moon so this is when the shadfish return moon. And I also wanted to point out that um, the importance of language, there is the Lenape um, version of that on the other side. So I'm going to read these first couple of pages to you. My grandparents' grandparents walked beside the same stream where I walk with my brother, and we can see what they saw. Deer leap in the woods, hawks fly in circles overhead. Frogs splash and turtles sun themselves. And then this is when the shadfish return moon. In early spring, when the shad bush blooms like a white lace veil, we go fishing. Dad smiles when my brother or I catch a shad. We roast the fish and everyone enjoys it, especially the dogs. So I hope that this has given you a little taste as to what's to come in this book, and I highly recommend checking it out. We do have a copy at the Blue Hill Library, so come check it out. And um, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that the Lenape uh, tribe um, is not m located in Maine. It's actually, um, they were actually known, Lenny Lenape, um, means first real or original people and sorry for the wind <laughs> it's just that's the way it is today um, and they lived uh, in a vast forest that covered parts of what are now called Pennsylvania New York New Jersey Maryland Delaware and Connecticut and um, and they survive so we just want to highlight that and um, yeah, thanks so much for joining me. I wish I could read you the whole story, but I'll trust that you all will check it out yourselves. So I'm going to turn things over to Kirsten Rickard, who's going to 
instruct us on how to make May crowns out of shad bush and apple blossoms and other things. And I just wanted to thank her for her time. And she also donated all of the beautiful silk ribbon for our craft kits this month. So thank you so much, Kirsten, for donating your time and your beautiful ribbons to us. So thanks everyone for joining us and over to you, Kirsten. Hi, I'm Kirsten Ricker. I am a mother and an artist. I love to work with found materials in nature, especially flowers. So spring's one of my most creative times. Today I am here making a very simple flower crown with the shad bush and the apple blossom. I have a few other flowers here as well, but we're going to start with the, the shad bush and the apple blossom as the base. So I always try to work with as little as possible and, and most preferably only found objects in nature. Uh, but some flowers, depending on the how woody they are and how flexible they are, need some support. And so today I have copper wire to work with, I've just a very fine gauge copper wire. So I've cut three pieces that measure around the head with a bit extra. And approximately three equal lengths that will go around the crown wearer's head. And then with the longest piece, you just wrap around a little bit. You want a little bit of end because they'll, they'll be helpful later for securing the, the plant stem. So that wrapped around and then we're going to braid these three pieces. So you create some space so they don't get tangled on the ends. And then just a generous braid, not a tight braid, sort of a big loose braid, which is pretty easy to do. So long as your ends don't get tangled up. As I said, my preferred way is to actually do the crowns when you get to just braid the plant. The nice thing about when you don't use the wire is you can just put it straight into the compost. When you're done wearing it. <laughs> or you can save it and dry it too, depending on the flowers. The shad bush is heading towards its end of its bloom. So the flowers are beginning to drop. So it's a really nice time to make them into crowns because the bees have had a chance to gather pollen And I've been eating nettles every day so that I have a natural antihistamine to pollen allergies. So that when I'm making things with the flowers <laughs> for the months of May and June, I don't sneeze too much. Okay, so that's braided. I'm just going to take that off and do a quick measurement. Now you want it to leave a little extra. You don't want it to be too tight because when you add the plants, it fills out. So I'm going to guess that that's about right. And then just take one of the wire pieces and wrap that around to secure that and leave those other ones out because you'll use those. Okay, that feels good. 
All right, so that's your base. And we're going to start with the shad bush. Have some lovely clippings here. So it's nice to find a piece that's long with lots of blossoms on it. Probably like that. Oh, and I'm seeing this one's lovely too. So I'm breaking off some of those bits. Scissors can be handy as well. Okay, so this is going to be the back of the crown where I did the, when I fastened the wire together. And that's where the woodier stems are going to go. We'll aim to put the flowers at the front and then the stems to the back. So I'm just creating a little separation in the braid of the wire and I'm feeding the stem through and then I'm wrapping it around the wire. And then the end of the stem is arriving to where the extra bits of wire are so that you can secure that stem with a little piece of wire. And that's nice and flexible. Okay, I'm just gonna check that that's gonna fit. Okay, yes, that's still gonna fit. And then with this extra flower at the top, I'm gonna to wind that around as well. And then I'm gonna open the braid and tuck the flowers in. So that's the process to make the base. We'll be selecting pieces of the shad bush threading it through the wire braid, wrapping it around and tucking the stems in. And hooking it with the wire. And it's looking pretty wild up the top here, but bit by bit, you'll wrap these flowers in and tuck them through the wire braid and then you'll add other flowers and they'll hold it. Okay. And so I'm working on both sides that way and then this way so that you, your flower crown has a sense of balance, which it doesn't have to. Asymmetrical crowns are lovely too. And each piece of stem, each piece of branch doesn't have to go all the way to the end. Once you have it beginning to fill out, you can just tuck the little bits into the wire and they'll stay there. looking for places where it needs to be filled out and then separating the wire, threading the flower in. And as you wrap the stem around and tuck it in, then you start hold, it just starts holding itself together. This is why sometimes you can do it without wire. If you have some really nice long branches you can just braid the branches themselves and then use a tiny bit of wire or a bit of ribbon to just create a circle braid done purely with the branches but these are just a little woody and not quite right for that
Okay, at this point too, once it starts to fill out, it's helpful to check your size because suddenly it might be that the crown gets too small or you've actually measured it too large and you would want to know that at this point before you get too involved. Oh, that's just right, great. If I'd made it too large, I'd probably, well, depending on how much too large, then I'd maybe add to the inside a bit more. The apple blossoms have only just started to bloom, but it feels like with the warmth of today, tomorrow they'll really pop. The shad bush really makes a lovely base. Okay, so just threading in and tucking, tucking, tucking now. All right, so there's the foundation with the shad bush. And now I'm going to add some apple blossom. This one's already made with apple blossom and shad bush. And this one is shad bush, crab apple, and pin pinberry? Pinberry. Sometimes you can use the woody stem of the apple. And sometimes it's too much, so you just break off these little snippets and then tuck them in. This is when the wire is very handy. You can just tuck them in and squeeze. Just create a little space, thread the flower in, and then... It's a bit like sewing, you just weave the stems in. Threading through and then bending the stem and pushing it just back into the wire and the other stems. And you just see little places, oh, that's going to be a nice spot to put one. And it's so, and it just holds itself just in and out. And there's a nice natural curve to the apple blossom too, where you really can just dip it straight in.
and then tucking it into the wire to be held. It's nice to stop and look too to see if it feels balanced. I can see that this side could do with some more. Just creating a little space, tucking it in. And securing the end with the wire. Now with the Shad bush and the apple blossom really filling that out. I feel like adding some other seasonal flowers that are in bloom that I brought because you don't always have everything available to you and we have to be careful how we harvest things. So I'm going to use some of this pinberry at the back here. It's so lovely when the flowers blossoms just become this <laughs> oh, cluster hold the, the, the way they hold each other together And then using the stem to wrap and that will create support for the back of the crown. If anything's sticking out, just tuck it in. Unless you like it sticking out. Some people really like these crowns that are <laughs> like sun rays. That's one of the lovely things about making flower crowns is they do have personalities of the people who make them. And they're not really meant to last. They're just an ephemeral experience. And the wildflowers, they, they often wilt fairly quickly, which is part of why they're so beautiful. Okay, that's starting to get quite a lot in it now. There's some bits that I feel like I want to tuck in. Now you could keep adding to it with different colors and different blossoms. Maybe I'll add some of these crab apples too. That pink's so lovely. So that's feeling pretty full. Okay, so you have your front. Now you could fill out the back too if you wanted to, but today I brought along ribbons. I have the silk ribbons that are 100% silk and then I have cotton bias. It's really nice to have natural fibers. Um, the cotton bias can be dyed and um, the silk ribbon has a, such a light quality, the way it can blow in the wind. Uh, let's see here, such fun colors. I 
So with this piece, I'm just going to cut that in half. I'm going to tie this here on one side. And then I'm just going to take around around to the center Actually, does that, is that did I go the right way there so I want them to be opposite this way so that I can tie them there now the same on the other side. Round. Now this is pretty fancy. You don't have to be this fancy, like I said. You can try to do it without wire and you don't even have to use ribbon. There we go. <laughs> you get petal confetti 